Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, what's in a name? Aloha mai kako. Welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox, president of PBS Hawaii. Now, at the beginning of her film, Kristen Marquez tells us the best way to learn a native Hawaiian name is to ask the person who gave it to you. But how do you do that when at the age of eight, you were taken away from the person who gave you your name? We've just viewed a haku inoa to weave a name, the story of Kristen's search for the meaning of her name and reconnecting with her mother, who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia when Kristen was just a child. And tonight on Insights on PBS Hawaii, we'd like to go deeper into the film to see if Hawaiian cultural beliefs can affect the diagnosis of mental health issues and to discuss the process that Kristen and her mother went through to produce this powerful film. All of us at PBS Hawaii are so very proud of Ehaku Inoa. As part of our commitment to independent filmmakers, we assisted Kristen with the production of this, her first feature documentary film. Working with her through this multi-year project was our Director of Learning Initiatives, a filmmaker himself, Robert Pennebacher. Robert, thank you so much for mentoring Kristen and your support of her film. Oh, my as always, Insights on PBS Hawaii invites your questions and your comments. Please call, email, or tweet your questions and comments to our panel. Tonight, we're also joined by a studio audience made up of students of Hawaiian culture, young filmmakers, and educators who will have the opportunity to ask questions of our panel as well. Welcome to you. And speaking of our panel, we have with us in studio, Victoria Holt Takamine is a Kumu Hula, and executive director of the Pa'i Foundation. Joseph, uh, let's, well, Nadine is first, so let's go to, oh, there you are, I'm sorry. Joseph Kiavi Aimoku Kaholokula is a psychologist, a health psychologist, and associate professor and chair of Native Hawaiian Health at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. Welcome. Dr. Nalin Andrade is a psychiatrist and a professor at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. And of course, Kristen Marquez is the filmmaker of A Haku Inoa to Weave a Name. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for your beautiful film. And also joining us in the audience is Kristen's mother, Eleanor, or Elena Marquez. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Marquez. Now, we know you, you're not feeling well, but you wanted to come and support your daughter and, and this program, so thank you so much. I want to ask you the first question, Kristen. So your stated reason for coming back was to find out the meaning of your Hawaiian name, and you got to know your mother, spend time with her. You pieced together the elements of your name, and your mom said, yes, that's what I meant. Did, you, did, did your search end with what you were looking for? Um, well, I think I talk about this film kind of just as the beginning kind of chapter in my um, I think development as a Hawaiian person who's interested in reconnecting with my Hawaiian culture and my Hawaiian heritage. So, I mean, this was sort of, in a lot of ways, my, my homecoming and reconnecting with my mom is the first step. So, I think, yes, I found what I wanted. And, I mean, I think the film says everything that I had hoped it would say. Um, uh, but it's not, this is not the end for me. <laughs> You had to do a lot of reading between the lines in understanding your mom. Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, I mean, that was a big part of the process, was just being able to understand that there's ways that she communicates that aren't, um, you know, that were different than I was used to. Um, and it's a lot of reading between the lines. <laughs> and over time, you, um, you wondered whether she indeed had schizophrenia when she was diagnosed, and what, what did that mean? Well, what are your thoughts about that now? Um, yeah, I, I actually try not to think so much about, you know, was the diagnosis correct or was it not? Um, for me at this point, it's, um, you, it's kind of a non-issue in a lot of ways. I, I do question it, um, but it's not, for me, I think, to dwell on that diagnosis at this point, um, it, it would be counterproductive. 
um, you know, it's just that that diagnosis was a turning point in the timeline of my family. And, um, you know, for me, when I came back, it was like, well, what do we do with that reality now? And, um, and obviously, I do think that, um, I, I stated in the film, I think that people could have been, um, you know, more culturally competent to be able to um, uh, help us, help my mother, make her feel more comfortable um, with their suggestions um, and kind of uh, for her treating her. Um, Do you still want the apology you never got for being hurt by your mother? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't need that anymore. <laughs> I'm okay. Beyond that? Yeah. Well, let's ask, we have two doctors on the panel, a uh, psychiatrist and a psychologist. Um, what were your thoughts as you saw this and the, and, and the, cultural, um, the cultural impact and, and the, the diagnosis? Dr. Andrade? Well, you know, the, in terms of the diagnosis, schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia, um, it also, though, what your mom talks about is about the depressions, episodes of depression. And when you watch her, you know, the, the term schizophrenia means a split from reality at times, at times, not all the time, but at times. And it's a chronic, unrelenting struggle. It becomes part of your life. And so how you deal with it is very important. Um, there's also, because of the depressions that are described by your mom, um, what we also call another diagnosis, schizoaffective, which at that time was not as popular a diagnosis. But that part has very affective irritability, a lot of the things, and it is worsened by um, having a child or many children, in this case three. And so it moves into that realm of what we call postpartum psychosis, postpartum depression. So all those elements are at stake here. And I'd be unethical to say that I could make a diagnosis tonight. But as you look at this film, you've actually very creatively and compassionately selected these different scenes uh, through your mom's life that sort of unveils for us a story that comes together. Um, the other piece about it is that the fact that your mom has not taken medication during this entire time is a credit to her, her intelligence, her brilliance, and her ability to put two cultural pieces together, which cannot be lost. Her Catholic faith, the artifacts of that Catholic faith, her hymnal, her mass, her rosary, all of the upbringing that she came with, complemented by the rigid uh, and regimented uh, knowledge that goes back millennia of a, a, a hula halau, the discipline of a hula halau. When they are pounding the ar artifact of that pahu, the hula sisters, and the na'au, and what you have there for Hawaiians is what we call, and what is between both of you and everyone you're related to, by blood and by aloha, is what we call the aka. These are cords of spirituality that are woven together. And they can never be severed unless one of you decide that's what you're going to do. What you have done is, in giving you that name, she has connected you not only to her, but to everyone who preceded you and everyone who will follow you. And that's what this is in this film, is that it's, a, it's not just a mele inua, it's an aloha of your entire ohana and how you have rewoven that aka. It was always there because at eight years old, when you left, she still taught you before she got ill in those episodes of illness, what your name was about. And you held that in your heart and soul. And what this was, was a ho'ala to reawaken it and then to really weave within those, those threads a new way as well. And that's what this film is. It's your gift, not just to your mother, your family, but to all of us, your people. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Ms. Marquez said, you know, when you give someone a name, they're gonna come to you and ask you what it's about. It, it, a, a connection, the, the name was more of a connection than you realized, it sounds like. And I've always felt that. I always felt it. And I knew that, I just knew that there was something, some way for it to manifest. Um, and yeah, this film is part of it, I guess. <laughs> Dr. Kaholokula, what were your thoughts? Yeah, you can't sit any better than Dr. Yeah. Andrade. She just hit it right there. Uh, 
But I, I got to agree, the diagnosis is irrelevant at this point. It doesn't matter. It's that relationship. And I kind of go back with, to what you said, Leslie, in the opening is that, you know, how did the Hawaiian culture affect the diagnosis? I would rather phrase it, how did American culture affect the diagnosis? Uh, what I saw in the film was really your mom struggling and was pointed out between two belief systems, her Catholic faith and her tr Hawaiian traditions. I mean, wanting not to cut your hair because of the, the ties that it has and the, and the significance it has to hula. Mm -hmm. and, but also struggling with, because of the Catholic church that wanted you to cut your hair. But it really reflects what is happening in our Hawaiian community and what sometimes leads to some of this, uh, what I might call mental illness or challenges, is that stress, that conflict we often have between we, who we are as Hawaiians, as Kanaka Maori, as Kanaka Oivi, and how we want to live and our aspirations, sometimes are challenged by mainstream society, whether it's through uh, not having our gathering rights, our ability to exercise our practices, really comes to, to a point where it can be a tremendous stressor, as Dr. Andrade pointed out, a young mother who is you know, challenged with the stressors of being a young parent, coupled with the idea that perhaps internally she was struggling with some of these differences in cultural belief systems, but she was trying to preserve both and be respectful to both. Uh, the, the film also spoke to me because it really, it, you know, as we as Kanaka, we really connect no matter where we go. We need that relationship. We need to find out. And it's so important because the name that is given, especially by the person that gives it, it is their hopes and aspirations for that individual, that that person will live up to that name. And usually there's multiple meanings to the name, one that is readily apparent just through the interpretation, and that the other, you know, usually is between the giver and the, the person that was given to, or even unknown to the person that was given the name. But that is a special thing, and you know, for her to go on this journey, I think just the whole process, I mean, she just really lived in this journey, her name, connecting back to her ancestors. Now, Vicky was a hula sister of, um of, of Kristen's mom. You knew her way back. And uh, what resonated most with you of, of this story? Well, you know, I, I knew Elena um, as a hamana, as a hula sister. We studied together for many years with Auntie Mikey. We practiced our oli and our hula. Um, and I watched her perform as well in several productions. So I, I knew her different from what is portrayed on this film. I knew her before she got married and before she had children. Um, so I have a different perspective of, of Elena as a vibrant, young hula dancer, kumu hula, hula sister of mine. Um, and I, I, I know that as we have given our children their names, um, they grow into that name. So it is, it's Elena's wish for what her child will become. So you grow into, you don't, you're not, when you're given a name, we know that we develop the ano or we take on the characteristics of our Hawaiian name. And so all of the aspirations that she has for her children have been bestowed upon them. And so to me, the eha that I felt when they were taken away, when she never had an opportunity to really see them grow into that name, to grow and to help them and to help nurture that was a big, was really hurtful for me as a mother to be taken away and to be told what's best for me and my children. Um, so I, I absolutely disagree with those decisions at 16 weeks, at, you need to go back on medication, you stop breastfeeding. It's like, um, that's not your decision. That's mine. And I would have fought a lot harder. I would have hoped my husband would have fought a lot harder for that too. Um, and helped to protect me and my family. You know, um, <clears throat> Kristen's mom didn't explain very much to her. And just, I think, with a, a lot of people here growing up, I mean, I think a lot of us are familiar with elders who didn't explain anything to us. We, you know, what's that all about? Uh, I don't know if that's cultural or old style, but um, she, didn't, she didn't get a lot of answers. And I wonder what you think when, when, when Ms. Marquez said, she talked about the hurt depressions and what she's had to put up with all these years. What did you think she meant? Well, 
you have to learn your own name. I think the, the journey is learning who you are and developing into that. So like I say, you take on the, you're given a name and you take on that. I didn't really know what my name meant to me. And my grandmother gave me that name. It's a name of a family ancestral name. We learn much later in our life what that name has become and who we are, what we've become is our name. So part of that is your journey, your journey of learning who you are and your brothers have yet to learn who they are by, and they grow into it. You grow into it, you develop with that and that's the Hawaiian name. Hawaiians don't tell you. You have to learn it on your own. It's part of the journey. I think there's a question from a viewer, <coughs> tailor made for you coming up, Vicki. I think I've heard you talk about your Christian faith. Um, from Kailua comes a question, why is there such a love for Christianity when in some ways it ruined the Hawaiian culture? Question from a viewer. You know, I, I've never had, um, I've never had a conflict between my Hawaiian cultural practice and I was baptized Mormon at the age of eight. I tell everybody I was born Hawaiian from inception. So for me, I was Hawaiian first. And if everybody wanted, if, if Akua wanted everybody to have the same religion, you'd all be Hawaiian too. <laughs> you know, right. I, I'd like to yes. actually add to that. The, the, people sort of dichotomize black and white, you know, Western Hawaiian. Shoes. If, if you understand the indigenous host culture of these islands, you also understand that we were inclusive. Aloha means to be empathetic, to put oneself into another place. And so Christian and Hawaiian is, you know, I, I love what my great grandfather said. You know, he was a, a practitioner of La'au Kahia. He had his Bible and he prayed to Kane and Ku and Hina when he did the five day ritual. And one of the, the minister asked him, he said, how can you do both? You have, you have your Bible and then you also are praying and doing the chants in Hawaii. And he said, I don't want to take any chances, <laughs> right? My mother moved forward 40 years later. I asked my mom, I said, Ma, how do we, we reconcile the fact that we are blessing this child in a congregational church and waiting for the blessing ua, the blessing rain? And she said, Malin, our God is much bigger than we human beings make him or her to be. So, you know, there's room in our faiths to do both. And Hawaiian culture, what is unique about our culture is we teach our children to navigate through boundaries and, and dimensions. Our ancestors are not merely the past guiding us in forward, they are alive for us. And that's what's happening in your life. Your ancestors are becoming alive for you again. And part of the key part of her name that I, that I picked up on was born with the sacred boundaries of genealogy or Hawaiian cultural understanding. What does that mean? That, well, if you're going to say something. Go ahead. Well, I was going to go back go to the Christianity okay. thing because I think for, for Native Hawaiians, they went to every church that they could because they believed in the power of prayer. They would pray in Hawaiian and they would go to the congregational church across the street and then have their service and then go to the Catholic one across the street. They would go to every church that had, because pule for them was, it didn't matter what akua, akua was the same akua. And so it didn't matter what religious affiliation you were with. The same akua or because the, there are multiple akua. Right? Yeah, but they're all akua. I mean, they're all, they're, I, for us it was somebody, a power that is greater than us. So Akua made all the plants and made the islands and made the, that, and that's our belief. We come from all of them. The fact that we have names in them in Hawaiian that are different, we're speaking to our Akua in the Hawaiian language, same God, no different God. I'd like to get back to your question about uh, uh, Kristen's name, you know, Heipua Koa Mana. You know, I thought, wow, what a name. But if you think about this film, what's really beautiful is, is that your mother, when you say the opening chant and you ask her, please, may I be your haumana? And she says something very important to you. It's secret. I can't chant back to you because that would make it public, right? It would take away some of what is sacred between us. But when you follow 
her actual actions as the film unfolds. What she is doing is teaching you. She's not telling you this is your name. She's allowing you to discover it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, you surprise her. You surprise her because you've always thought ahead. And that's her faith in you, that you will get the lesson and you will learn it in a uniquely Hawaiian way, which is that you don't just ask the question. That's not just niele, curious. It's also mahaoi, pushy, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what you literally did in getting <laughs> her artifacts, right? Hello. With, you know? Like and, and, and it's like, okay, and, and her words to you, oh, haole from the mainland, right? What she's saying is, it's, yes, it, it's painful to hear that, but what she's capturing is something every Hawaiian child who has grown up, you yourself as well, is the pain of what happens when a, a, an oppressive, and it doesn't have to be haole. We call it haole, but let me tell you, it could be other Hawaiians, it could be other Polynesians, whoever has the power, right, in a society to dominate it mm -hmm. can, can really make these kinds of changes. But what she's telling you is, you know, watch and learn, you know, because I would be severely corrected, not punished, corrected. Mm -hmm. yeah? and, and that's what she does in this unfolding. And I'll just share this one, when I watch this film, what comes to mind is you and your editor have selected out scenes that are like pearls. You know, pearls because pearls are made, they're little bits of sand that through the agitation of the ocean and the world become these beautiful, lustrous pearls. And what you've done is you've selected out these pearls from this story and the bond between your mother, your mother has helped you wo weave when you are weaving that hoe you know, into your hey, That's what you wove together in your kahaku was bringing that spring of, that, that those, all those pearls into a string, ale momi, ale. And that's what this film is for us. Your mother taught you to do that. It's remarkable, it's quite brilliant, both of you. And I, I just really thank you both for, for this gift. Last thing, as a psychiatrist, the biggest thing we fight with mental illness is stigma. This film, what makes it so powerful is not just the cultural undertones about it that underpins everything. It tells us what, what her hula sister said. I see beyond what the world tells me I should see to her heart, to her soul, and she saw your heart and soul, and she healed her daughter in her own way and made you a much stronger person. That's what stigma and mental illness is about, to get beyond that. Once we get beyond the stigma, we see the person. And that's what Kavai was saying, her exactly. friend, right? I see her heart. Yes. Uh, we have a tweet from Kumuhina saying, Ho'omaika'i, weave a name, a timely reminder of the need for Hawaiians and all to seek connection with family, community, and culture. Let's go to our studio audience, see if anybody has any questions or <coughs> comments to bring you into this. Please, go ahead. We, let's get you a microphone. Hello, my name is Sam. I'm an engineer at UH. And something that uh, confused me, it may have uh, been just part of the culture, but when she was, uh, when your mother was really trying to plan that reunion to a T, you know, where everyone has to wear the right T-shirt, is that like a cultural thing or was that a mix of both the cultural and the mental illness? Thank you, Sam. Um, well, I think my mom had been living in kind of isolation for a really long time, and I think that exercise of her, um, you know, planning this reunion, it became a way for her, at least in her mind, to stay connected to her family because, I mean, culturally speaking, if you kind of want to put it into that context, you know, family is extremely important to Hawaiians. But, you know, I think for a lot of reasons, my mother had been, like, oki, like, cut off from her family. Um, and I mean, I understand why there was, I think people didn't really know how to, how to deal with what was going on with my mom, you know, like that kind of, and that goes back to, you know, lack of education, understanding, you know, access to care um, for mental illness. And, you know, my mom's very, really healing and clever way to deal with that was to plan this family reunion and always remember her family and always keep them in her heart. And you know, it, um, you know, it was very frustrating because it's like, oh mom, like it doesn't matter what color socks people wear to the reunion. Like, but so like, you know, once we kind of 
even though I think mom still wants everybody to have special color socks. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's, it wasn't about that, you know, and that's why I think for me, I was just like, we ju I just have to push her to go see them again. And once that connection is reestablished, you know, then maybe we can work on t-shirts. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Uncle Joe, a Hawaiian Homes Commissioner, and he says, and he's responding to Vicky's comment about pule, the difference bet between in Hawaiians and religion is that Hawaiians go to church 24 hours, others only go one hour. <laughs> questions, other questions from the studio audience, please. Uh, Mike Gordon, uh, let's give him a mic. Oh, I'm sorry, there you are. ACM. Um, Academy. Uh, my question was, is, and actually is kind of interesting, the documentary brought together a concept of um, holistic medicine not just being um, cultural based in the sense that uh, it fixes you physically but also mentally. Um, for you guys, how would you implement culture to help out with mental illness um, through a healing process? Is there, is there any way to do that? You know, it's really interesting. Um, I've actually used name, Hawaiian name, as part of a, a method in therapy to connect, especially with younger folks. So a lot of them don't really know their names and they're struggling with their identity. So I work with a lot of Native Hawaiian youth. One of the things I would, wanted to do with them was to have them actually learn more about their name. It's really interesting. You ask them, what, is your, what does your name mean to you? And as Auntie Vicky was saying, you know, a lot of them have to grow into it. But they don't even understand even the basics of it. What was amazing was when, you know, they got excited about it, they would go out and ask. I would ask them, go ask the person that gave it to you, ask your parents, and I understand there may be a part of the name that you cannot share, and that's okay. But I ask that you do this and share what you can with me. And they would come back, and they would have these great names and with great interpretations, and with great genealogy belonging to chiefs. And we'd, I would use that as a, as a way to go forward in therapy to establish their identity, to establish that they have a solid foundation and that there's a purpose in their lives and that they need to aspire to what that name was given for. And the kids respond to it well. Uh, I think for the first time, they, they've actually found something that's, that's part of them and connects them to something greater. By the same yeah. token, can a name hold them back? I think only a person can hold you. You, know, you can only hold yourself back. Uh, but, you know, the great thing about Hawaiian culture is we can also change names as we move up or move across society, different uh, aspects of careers, perhaps. Uh, many times our Ali'i has, has changed their names as they went into a different phase of life For or example. elevated. Uh, I would ask Auntie Vicky to some, give some good examples <laughs> so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> Well, but I think, for example, uh, we, we can take on uh, Kamehameha, for example. Exactly. They have many, many different names, and as they go through their stages of, so he was given Paiea at the very beginning. He earned the name Kamehameha. So you earn your names as you go along. So many of our Hawaiians have different names that we earn as we, as we grow up. Um, but I wanted to address your question and I'm going to only approach it as a cultural person, not as a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist. But I think the one thing for me is that culturally, you involve the family in the healing. You don't take the family away and separate it. So what, for me, what was really hard was that Elena was separated from all of her family, not just her children and her husband, but her family in Kohala. That that physical isolation, the, where she lived was typically isolated. And her genealogy obsession was her attempt to connect back to her family, which is the only thing that can heal her. And that can, that really, when we, when we isolate ourselves away from those that love us the most, that understand us the most, that are most patient with us, that are the most compassionate, then you end up in an institution and then you end up on medication. And for me, what was really critical for, for Elena was her strength in resisting that medication and clinging to her genealogy and her ancestors and her family. And that, to me, was part of her healing. Yeah. Let me, I'd love to just kind of introduce, because you've heard two different, let, let me share a third one. 
And that, this comes from Bruce Wexler. And this is the neurobiological aspects of culture and how they help in the treatment of, of patients um, and persons who suffer from severe mental illness where your neurotransmitters actually really skew the way you think, the way you feel, the way you perceive. And that's important, that's a reality physiologically. But one of the things he talks about is in our brains, we have these trillions of neurons or, or ner nerve, uh, brain cells. And between those brain cells are yet billions of <coughs> synapses that connect us. And it doesn't mean that culture's in one part of your brain or another. If you think about it, our brains are limited by this cranium, this skull. But beyond it is our minds, and that's the part that's cultural, <coughs> that go far beyond forever into the universe. And that's the part where neurobiologically, we have what is called neuroplasticity. All of these trillions of synapses combine together to help us have contextual understandings, including we hear the voices of our ancestors, we are guided by them. All of the things that um, your mother did to put things together when she was alone was a combination of all of those neural synapses reconstructing in her mind a life without her children and then a life isolated at least for a while from her brothers and sisters on the big island. Okay. And what she did is remarkable. That's the point I want to make. Culture can be utilized in a variety of ways, not just Hawaiian. You know, we have, as human beings, we can take upon ourselves any culture, any sense of spirituality, any religion, and create for us a new context within ourselves that then underpine how we conceptualize our minds to make up the deficit that is no longer there. That's the miracle of what we watched on this film, and we should not lose sight of it because it will continue on for both women. Thank you, that was powerful. Questions? Please. Uh, my name is Mike Gordon, uh, I'm a journalist, and I have a question for Kristen. Um, of all the answers to the questions that you asked your mother as you were making this film, uh, which one meant the most to you? Hmm. Wonderful question. Yeah, that's a good question. Ooh. Um, well, I don't, I don't, I guess that the question, the largest question in the film is, for me, is who is my mother? And I mean, now I know the answer to that question, and the answer to that question is our relationship. So there's nothing, there's no, you know, it's the answer isn't 42. <laughs> but um, that's, that's the answer, <laughs> is the relationship we can now have. You had to stick with it, though, because early on there was, I mean, you could have um, considered what your mom was saying to you slights and been really put off. I did. <laughs> I, 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 I don't blame you, but you, but you stuck with it. Well, that was my, I had, and that's when I realized I have to adjust how I'm interpreting her, what she's giving to me. You know, I was interpreting that in a very American or Western way, the things, the things that she was giving to me. And I needed to, you know, and, and through kind of reading and understanding more and talking to other people about how to interact um, with my mom, I learned how to read her correctly, you know? And I think, you know, my brothers still struggle with that, um, how, how to understand her. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a completely different mode of communication. I think you were actually very Hawaiian as well. Because remember what your aunt said to you at the beginning? I wasn't like your mom who listened and absorbed it. You became like your mom, listening and absorbing. But you were like your auntie. Why? How come? Right? That's what you were doing. So it's very Hawaiian too, to be in the LA, in a good way, right? The curiosity. I think your question is, is a really wonderful question. The most powerful statement or question your mother made was when you were telling her about your pain and your forgiveness, but you're wanting an apology. She did something so beautiful to me, uh, and it's nonverbal. Mm. She didn't get a Kleenex, she didn't mm -hmm. say stop crying, you shouldn't cry, which most parents would say something like that. She did something incredibly Hawaiian. It's what my mama would do, it's what your kupuna would do. 
She wiped your tears with her hands. She blended her mana with yours in the most intimate way. And that said everything. That said everything. Yeah. I was struck by what um, the Kohala Hula sister Kavai said about don't let other things cloud your instinct. But that presumes that your instinct is intact. How do you make sure of that? Mm. Your instinct is intact. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, you just gotta, you just gotta go with it. You just gotta, you just, you just know from your na'o. And you just gotta be guided by that and kind of just go with it. I think sometimes we think too much about stuff. And when we think too much about things, we start to get hesitant. We start to question and question our, our own, you know, our ability to do something. And then we spend more time questioning and just wondering about the consequences of that, that we end up not engaging in it. Uh, you know, part of what I was hearing this discussion, you know, one of the things I want to go back to is really interesting is that religion aspect. Because um, someone from my generation, you know, we're, we're trying to return to a more ho'omanakahiko, or traditional way of spir being spiritually. And for many of us, you know, we, we look at our spiritual belief system, these ancestors, call it akua. Akua doesn't equal God. Someone else told us Akua equals God and, and interpreted our culture for us and told us what is normal, what is not normal, what is okay to do in society, what is not, and what is our own language is like. Um, but for us, from people of my generation, I ask the question many of times, you know, about religion and what it has done for our people. And, and at one hand, it was what we use to, to uh, deal with the situation and get through the situation, get to the point we're at now, but it's also kind of what created the situation for many of us. So it's, it's very interesting. The very thing that perhaps put us into a situation of despair is the very thing that we look towards to get ourselves out of despair. And now in this generation, we're, we're coming to a point where we're looking at both sides. I see, you know, it's kind of reflected in, the, in this show with um, your mom. You know, she's kind of in these two worlds. And you know, I can only imagine at a young age when she had children, she was struggling and, and then being confronted with CPS and the idea of, of taking the children away and, 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 and these two conflicting, but yet you know, she holds on to these two as very personal and very a part of who she is, her Catholic faith and her, and her culture. Um, and it's kind of reflect, it's, it's kind of what we're going through now as a people is we're at a, a crossroads where we're, we're looking at things and the question brings it up, you know, what is it? Who are we? Are we the Protestant? I was baptized Protestant. <coughs> um, are we these? And how do they come together for us? And how do we move forward? Um, I guess we've got to use a na'o for that one. And you know, I can't help but think that this discussion is very healing for Christian's mom. Isn't it? Yes. Just, just hearing it discussed. I've never, I've never heard it uh, mentioned out in the public before. Excuse me, my voice. I've got a terrible cold. And uh, thank you very much for your manao, Kauna. So the search widens, and ans more answers are woven into your search. Other questions from our studio audience. Yes. Hi, my name is Roxanne, and I, I feel like you. This, it was so moving. This film, it was. It, it felt the connection between mom and and daughter in the nonverbal ways. And um, for you, I know you always said that spiritually, you felt your mom, even across the ocean. I mean, you felt her. You thought she was outside your window. I mean, it, did you feel like she was calling you home, or a sense of that you needed to? come and get reconnected to her? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you picked up on, you know, sometimes I'm, I wonder if, just as a filmmaker, if those things are too subtle in the film, but oh, no. that's left, you know, I, that's exactly why I put that scene there to show that even though we weren't there, she was always there. Right. And um, for a long time, and it was, I mean, being rem removed from Hawaii, you know, as much, I actually really liked living in Seattle. It was mm -hmm. lovely. But um, being removed from Hawaii had these, uh, 
these impacts on me that I didn't understand, you know, probably until two years ago. And I was really angry and, um, you know, I, I missed my mother. So, and again, in the film, it, I kind of, it was easier for me to forget everything, just look away, you know, and try to just move on. Like, okay, I'm American now. <laughs> um, but as uh, Kuma Vicky and uh, Nalin have said, you know, that, and that's a choice that I was, had made, but really that connection was still too strong. You really can't, it's hard to cut <laughs> that connection. Um, so it, there was always, I was always gonna come back. <laughs> but do you know why that also, what was facilitating your involvement in hula? So when you get involved in your cultural practice, then that awakens your na'au and your connection and your bond yeah. and your kupuna start speaking to you. So when they start talking to you, don't be afraid of it because it's, it's just, a, you know, it's our ancestors talking to us through our, our na'au and we know what we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and what your answers are going to be and it's whether you act on it or not. But it's only when you get involved in a cultural practice as a Hawaiian that you really get to understand what it is to be Hawaiian. So the fact that your, your brothers have their translation of their name, but they don't know what it means, mm. it's because they haven't connected with their Hawaiian culture and their, you know, a practice that will help them to better understand that. But it was really your initiative to take hula in New York, mm -hmm. of all places, um, same line, even Auntie Mikey's <coughs> line. Same <laughs> line with Auntie Mikey's line, yeah, with you some of my a, students. You create a context yeah. for you yeah. to be Hawaiian, even away from the islands. You create a context, and it's in that context that the, your Hawaiian is expressed, and you created that. Yeah. yeah. Then, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I remember the first time I heard the Ipuheke, like, in New York. It was like, it was just like my whole body was like, Chicken so, skin. Yeah, it was crazy, and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do, you know? So, I was going to say, I, I want to introduce the concept again, really sort of to expand our minds beyond just thinking Hawaiian or Western, to think beyond and share the, the world knowledge that we have at hand. And for me as a psychiatrist, you asked the question, Leslie, about instincts. What happens when you lose sight? Well, let's just sit back and, and think about what Sigmund Freud said and then his daughter, Anna, who improved upon that model. He created the structural model of the mind which says to us that most of what we do is unconscious. There's just a little bit of us that's very, very conscious and right below the surface, pre-conscious. Pre-conscious minus if I said to any one of you, what's your phone number? Just a second ago, you didn't know what that was, now you do. Every one of you are thinking of it. That's pre-conscious. And basically what he said is the, the, the unconscious and the conscious mind was not enough to explain what we do and the instincts. And so he created a second model to extend that. And it, it's the ego, the id, and the superego. And we all hear about it. Well, guess what? The id is the instincts. And when the instincts are out of control, it's what we call primary process thinking, and it's, it's psychotic thinking. It's the kind of thinking when you're dreaming, you're driving a car and riding a horse at the same time, and it all makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the ego, Right? And the ego does a wonderful thing, and that's what this film shows us. The ego has a, a small conscious part, but a larger unconscious part, which is called the defense mechanisms. So when you start to feel angry, and you had every right to be angry, what you did is create this film, which is a defense, the highest level of sublimation. It's a defense me mechanism that evolves and, and percolates through in your conscious mind, and it fixes that, and, and it transforms that anger and in, in, into a learning experience for all of us. Finally, what your mom did in, in that, that ritualized putting together your family reunion and genealogy, that's the superego. That's the part of us, the do's and oughts and ought not to do, and all the wonderful rules and standards our kupuna and our parents put upon us that say, this is the way you should live your life. This is why family is important. This is why you need rules and order. This is the yardstick I put into you by which you will guide your life and you will measure every part of your life by that standard. That's what your mom was doing in that beautiful summary before you. And so it's another way of thinking about the mind and the brain. 
And that too is cultural. And that is a rich inheritance we should never deny. But just make it better for what we live in. We have a question from a viewer and other cultures are checking in now. Uh, question is, uh, what about the name Marquez? What about being Filipina, English, French, German? How do you weave those names into your life? Yeah, I mean, this film is really focused, obviously, on my Hawaiian name. But yeah, I have a much longer name. And I'm, I'm proudly, you know, multiracial. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, that's just part of, again, the inclusiveness of being Hawaiian. It doesn't negate what I am, who my ancestors are on my Hawaiian side. Um, you know, and I guess maybe I should go to Ilocos and figure out who, who those ancestors are sometime, but um, hopefully that film wouldn't take as long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Questions from our studio audience, please. I have a filmmaker question for Kristen, and I was really fortunate to be able to observe um, the process of uh, you making the film over the um, five years. <laughs> but I've seen this many times. What, what still just boggles my mind, and this is a compliment, how, how you pulled this off, is how, how were you able to tell a story that had yet to happen? Yeah. And, and the production is a very tricky thing. And so how do you, how did you tell a story that had yet to occur? Um, actually, I was just recently looking at the, um, at the very first R&D proposal that I was like successfully funded with. And I was really surprised how kind of a lot of the elements were there. Um, I think, I mean, at that point, it was uh, very focused on the name. So I, since I had that kind of as the, the guiding kind of mission once there is kind of a turning point in the film where I'll, like the name kind of becomes irrelevant um, and it becomes more about the mission between or not the mission but the um the relationship between me and my mom so it the first half of the film i think in many ways is very focused on the mission of the name and then the turning point is really like my my cultural mindset when i make that shift and like oh it's not about like mom tra like just telling me what it is, I need to sit and just spend time and figure it out. And then that's kind of in a lot of ways the second half of the movie. So um, in terms of telling a story that hasn't happened yet, I think, you know, I, th I think if you just have a really strong mission statement in a lot of sense, something's gonna happen and you just follow that, see where it goes. And you know, that's, in a lot of ways, that's what makes the film successful is because um, because I'm learning in the film. There's obviously there's going to be an arc. Like there's it's just me uncovering things. So as that goes, um, the viewer is just coming with me. We know you you you've uh, shot for hours and hours and hours and hours over over multi years. Um, did you? What did you struggle most about leaving out? Because things had to hit that cutting room floor. What did you really want to keep in there? Actually, when I watch the film now, I really, really I, Kavai's interview, um, her hula sister. I could just watch the whole tape. Just, just watch the whole tape. And there's a cut in there that's um, it's like a dissolve in the middle of what she's saying. And just for to fit into this hour, I really had to cut what she says there, but there's another three minutes in there that are just amazing as well, and you could just let it play, because it's great. Questions from the audience. We're running a sort of time, so please, if you have a question, ask it. <coughs> or comment. Oh, there we go. My name is Joanna Gordon. I'm an English major. And um, my question is more of an artistic question. So I guess I'm wondering, um, you have a scene in your film where you show yourself struggling and fighting among the waves in the sand. And I guess I was wondering um, why you chose to use a beach that's kind of not recognizable as a typical beach from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And like what that means with a underlining meaning. Sure, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, that's. That's a beach um, on Hawaii Island. That's a, it's a place that's significant to my family, 
and my um, where my family comes from. Um, and it's a black sand beach, so it's. Um, I mean, I guess it's atypical in terms of being white. Not it's not Waikiki. It's not blue, um, but and and white sand. But I mean, for me personally, it was important for me to go there to that place and touch that land, and um, and I think visually, actually, it really made sense. It's murky. It's kind of black. It's mysterious. And you know, at that point at least what I wanted to kind of express in the film is that it was, that I wasn't there yet. So I was lucky enough that it, um, visually it made sense as well. But um, in a Hawaiian kind of cultural way, it was significant as well. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from Sonia, a social worker from Honolulu, perhaps Dr. Uh, Kaholokula could take this one on. Comment is, while I agree with the importance of family involvement, it's simplistic to say one can heal through culture when someone is in mental health crisis. That one can heal through culture. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question because I really feel that it's, it's cultural discord or, or some kind of disconnect, whether it's relational. Well, in, in Hawaiian sense, everything's relational. You're relational to your akua and so forth. So culture for many of us is really a way to heal. It is what we use to heal. In this case, we talk about Hawaiian culture because culture is everything, right? Culture is what we choose to wear, who we choose to interact with. But when we talk about culture, we're talking about the value structure, the value system of a particular group. Uh, it, it, many times, what, what I, my experience has been is there's a disconnect between people's values, whether whatever that cultural value may be, whether it's a religious value, whether it's just a personal value, and what they really want to do in life and the behaviors they're expressing. Um, and often I, just, I think of it as, as once our purpose as mental health professionals is to connect, make the behaviors match the values they have. And most people have great values. You think of an abusive male, for example, they love their family, they love their wife. And when you ask them, why do you do the things you do to your family? It's because most often they say, because I love them, which is ironic. But yet, you know, the very ones that are hurting their family. So the behavior is in disconnect with the values. And, you know, for many of us, and perhaps for your mom, maybe there was kind of a, this, this, there's a value system there that wasn't allowed to be expressed appropriately in the cultural or societal context, or maybe the family context. But is there a role for medication uh, sure. to treat a chemical imbalance? Sure, yeah. And you work in concert to Many do that? Many times, when it was severe mental illness, you work in concert with psychotherapy or cultural therapy and, and it, medication. Right, the other thing too is social workers are experts at assessing the social network and, and indeed the family. And, and even if they make, if they, they don't make these decisions lightly when they say a family, a children have to be separated from a mother mm -hmm. and the father, okay, as happened in this case. I tell you, they take those families home with them and they don't sleep well. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, a, it's for a social worker, for a psychiatrist, for a pediatrician, and for a judge. These are some of the most painful decisions that keep you up at night. If you can do that for a time and then come back and, and do the healing, th that's the best thing. I mean, one of the things that's implicit in this movie is the beautiful aloha your father has. Mm -hmm. He raised you children. I think he did a remarkable job, you know? And his family in Seattle, I'm sure, was part of your extended and close ohana that made you the person you are and your brothers. Wonderful young men, you know, that we saw in this film. That's a testimony to your dad and the fact that your mom and he still have this wonderful relationship where you called him to say this is, you know, an out of the believe it or not occurrence on the phone. I thought that that said everything. And he said to you, come back, you folks, your mom is ready. He still had his fears, but go back. She's ready to tell you what your names mean. Uh, that's, you know, we have to remember that, that part that here's this Haole guy and he loves this Hawaiian woman still. That's aloha at work. His culture has room for her culture as well. And because of that, his children are the people they are. And you know, we are getting so close to the end of our time here together. It's how hard to leave this discussion. What are the next steps for you and your mom? Well, what are the next steps for us? Well, um, we've been, you know, sharing some 
songs and chants and that kind of thing. We um, just spend time together and, you know, I, I don't know, we have the rest of our lives, I guess. <laughs> Why put a, t a clock on it? Yeah. Ms. Marquez, would you like to say anything to close our show? Just thank you very much for coming together here like this and being interested in seeing how she gets to find her name, her Enoa. Thank you so much. And we have a comment from Paulette on the Big Island about you. Filmmaker's mother is a regal woman full of poise and grace. She represents Hawaii very well. Thank you to everyone here for participating and thank you for this beautiful film that you and your mom and uh, it, it, we're just, it's just something that I'm good. I've watched it about four times and I've, I'm just beginning. <laughs> thank you all for being here. In two weeks on the next Insights on PBS Hawaii, from Kauai across the state to Hawaii Island, our state has become ground zero for the debate over GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. Some farmers and ranchers say they can't survive without GMOs and the associated pesticide use. Many consumers and residents are concerned about their health and what they're eating. What do GMOs mean for our crops, for our food, for Hawaii? Insights on PBS Hawaii will provide a platform to discuss and debate this highly charged topic and will give you the opportunity to comment or ask questions regarding GMOs in Hawaii. That's in two weeks on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho!